to the present day Sudan. And so I want to make sure you'll have European Egyptologists say that Kemet is the child of the Nile, of Hapi Ikiru. But I want to make it clear that Kemet is the child of the African continent. And so the gift came from Western Africa, from the Sahara, as it died, dried up. Africans moved down to the valley. Africans from South Africa were migrating and moving. Africans from East Africa, West Africa, and ancient Kemet was a depository of all this information because we wrote it in stone. So I wanted to be clear, it's not just the gift of the Nile, the Hapi Ikiru was definitely the focusing point because of the water, the longest river in the world, over 4,160 miles long, okay? But I want to make sure that we understand that Kemet is the child of Kush or Kosh, and that it is the child of the African continent. It's like the mouthpiece of the African continent. It would be like Mfundishi speaking, and they was like, did you see his lips? His lips is what he was all about, forgetting the rest of my body and my mind and my consciousness. Well, that's the way Kemet was. So we got to put everything in a proper spatial perspective. <clears throat> you all have to excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold. Um, last week, I showed you the proper spatial perspective of the world, and specifically Africa, and that we've been looking at the world upside down, inside out, and backwards. The Hopi River flows down north from up south. South is the highland flowing down. So I gave you a really good spatial perspective last week. So I'm kind of reviewing what we did. Kemet actually started its journey about 6,000 years ago. Well, actually 6,000 BCE, which is about 8,000 years ago. So today, as I talk about the Greeks and the Romans, who are veggie backing deep off of what was done in ancient Kemet, I need you to see the origin of what they, where their history comes from. Who were the original people there? Um, and how did they get this information? Because we have to understand that the Greeks and the Romans is the foundation of Western civilization. So really what we're trying to say here is that Africa is the foundation of Western civilization. You, it won't get printed in any media, it won't get printed in any university, but technically that's what we are talking about that Africa gave birth to civilization as we know it on the planet Earth since the last ice age. And I need to say that since the last ice age because that happened approximately 10,000 years ago. I'm saying to say that there were other civilizations that existed prior to the last ice age. But after the last ice age, maybe 85 to 90 percent of the world's population was decimated. So a lot of those great sages, great philosophers, great builders, you see uh, where the Bermuda Triangle is, there's pyramids under the water there. They didn't build the pyramids under the water. That means that the Earth's geographic shape was different. Off the coast of Portugal, there are pyramids, a pyramid just as big as Khufu's pyramid in Kemet. It wasn't built under the water. Okay, I'm just trying to let you know. Off the coast of Japan, there are pyramids that's underwater, all right? So I'm trying to show you places around the world where there were ancient civilizations that were destroyed. Now, one of the reasons why the ancient Kemet U began to write in the Madhu Netcha, the divine word, is because we had a very oracle civilization. Everything was passed on from teacher to student, and it was kept alive in songs and dance. But if the great musicians were all destroyed, some of the great priests were all destroyed, then people had to start all over again. So that's what's happening in this modern world that we're in now, since the last ice age, is that civilization had to start all over again. And the ancient Kemet U, as they began to amass this information, they wrote it in stone so that if there was ever another great catastrophe on the planet, that they would have written it in stone of who we were, who we are, and who are we to be. Okay, so that is clear. So that's what the Madhu Netcha, I'm a, people know that I teach the Madhu Netcha. It's our classical language of African people, and I think that it's extremely important that we grasp this language. You see, as I talk about the Greeks and the Romans, 
their classical language is wrong, is Latin. Latin and Greek. If we created Latin, we created, we taught the Greeks, and we don't know our stuff. So we can't go to their stuff to find us. Because they're telling their story. That's why it's called history, his story. Whoever controls the situation defines the situation. So I need you, that to, I want that to stay in your head. Whoever controls the situation defines it. Now they define Rome as the greatest Western power ever. But what was Rome? It was tyranny. It was colonization. It was enslavement. It was homosexuality at its highest level. It was all of these things that we don't hold in high esteem. Did that make them the greatest nation in the world? We have to begin to classify. What is that? America is trying to imitate what Rome was doing. <clears throat> in fact, a lot of the Masonic Order brothers will say, if the Roman emperors were here today, they would be proud of America. Because it has its foot and its tentacles in everybody's business. It's colonizing, it's decimating all the people here in North America. It's enslavement, and now we're embracing uh, confused sexuality. Uh, just like Rome. So Rome would be actually proud of America right now. But I'm going to show you that that's nothing. You see, the Greeks and the Romans did not grasp the 42 oracles of Ma'at. In fact, morality was never even questioned or talked about in ancient Greece after they basically eliminated the indigenous people. Every place you go in the world, any records of ancient Kemetists says they are the most spiritual people on the planet. Everybody's record. There was no churches, no mosques, no temples, because everybody had their shrine in their home. So your place of worship was your home. Those temples were like universities and repositories of information okay, where etiquette and things of that nature was taught about your ancestors and how to keep it alive. And so there was no need to have a whole lot of churches. There was no need to have the comedic spiritual priest. is not like a preacher today. I had a, a gentleman came up to me. He said, oh, Infamishi, man, you just like my preacher, man. You running it down. I said, how long have you been to that church? He said, 20 years. I said, can you do what your preacher does? He says, no. I said, well, he's not like me. Because right? if you was with me 20 years, you would be running your own center, your own center God, your own temple. You would have your own university going. I'm proud to have students around the country who are running their own centers, running their own shrines. I don't want them to stay up under here. I want them to be able to fly. Falcon. That's what it's all about. Shemsu Haru, followers of the great Falcon. So I'm trying to set up where we were last year, I mean last week, so that we can move forward. Um, we got to the point where after the four golden ages of ancient Kemet, and let me go back, the first golden age is headed by Narma, or some people call Menek. That's approximately 4240 BCE. That's 6,258 years ago. So I'm trying to put these dates because I had a timeline up yesterday, I mean last week, and um, today I have a timeline for the Greeks and the Romans. So uh, it's on a different tape, so I can't pull that one up, but I, mentally it's all in here. So the second golden age is Menchu Hotep, who I wrote a book about, who was a Magi, and this book is Menchu Hotep in the Spirit of the Magi. And that takes place about 2000 BCE. So that's approximately 4,000 years ago, Mencho Hotep set up the second golden age. The third golden age is by Amos, the son of Tetrasheri, okay, who was the great African queen from Nubia, from ancient Kush. He defeated the enemy, kicked out the Hyksos, and started the glorious 17th, 18th dynasty. Now we're about 1500 BCE. This is still before. I'm at the third golden age. There are no Romans. There are no Greeks. 
The Japanese haven't gotten to the southern islands of Japan yet. There is no civilization in Western Africa. There is no civilization as we know of it on this high level in North America or South America. The Olmecs and the Aztecs haven't started there yet. So I'm trying to put things in a spatial perspective. You see what's going on. We're at the third golden age, <coughs> almost 3,000 years, and the rest of the world is still sleeping. Now we go into the fourth golden age. This happens around 725 in the, uh, still in BCE. And this is by the Kushites who uh, chase the Libyans out and the foreigners and reunite ancient Kemet again, north and south. So you have Tahaka, um, Shabaka, these powerful brothers who came from ancient Kush and then they start the fourth golden age. And this fourth golden age is the last about a hundred years. And then the Persians finally come in and conquer them. You have the Assyrians and then the Persians defeat the Assyrians. And that's about 625. Now, this is when the great philosophers in the world began to emerge. When Kemet, fourth golden age, comes to an end. So I need you, I know you people are not putting the research together, but I've done the research. Uh, Zen, Taoism, 600 BCE. The teachers from ancient Kush, when they were controlled, they left and spread their wisdom towards Asia. The Shang Dynasty, ancient China. The first two dynasties in China, the Shang One and Shang Two, done by Kushites, Africans. The first uh, shogun of Japan, a black man from ancient Kush. Okay, so I'm trying to put things in proper perspective. Now you got the Davidians in India. Uh, you got all of this is happening as the fourth golden age of Kemet comes to a close. Now the rest of the world is beginning. The Olmec head in South America, Mexico. All this is beginning to happen now that ancient Kemet has come is being controlled now by others. So a lot of these teachings left and are spreading the world. And you'll notice there's a common thread among all these spiritual teachings where they've taken from the 42 oracles of Ma'at, they've taken from Ma'at, the, the discipline and the philosophy, they're all biting hard on Jehuti, the wisdom teacher. In fact, if you go to Washington, D.C., or in the House of Congress on the door, it said all wisdom starts with Jehuti. And they show it right there on the wall. And they break it down. Then they go to the Asians, then they go to Socrates, and all of these people who I'm going to show today all studied in ancient Kemet. So, in order for us to get this information out, we're going to have to write the book. So that's why it's important. Uh, I'm proud to say that my book, Spiritual Warriors and Healers, is being used in over 24 universities uh, in Africana studies here in America and being used uh, in other parts of Africa. In Egypt, my book is banned. It's contraband. Now, my book is about ancient Kemet. But see, ancient Kemet has nothing to do with modern-day Egypt, the Arabs. And so what happened in Egypt today, the Nubians are beginning to get consciousness. You see, Africans here in America, y'all don't know how powerful you are. When you begin to protest and stand up for your rights and demand a proper education and proper living, other people around the world are hearing that. South Africa's movement, Veggie backed off of the movement here. They marched and sang just like we did here. In my country, Tanzania, the same thing happened under Julius Nieri and them. They were echoing what was going on in America. As you know, the first president, um, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana in 1957, outside of Ethiopia, went to school here, came here to be a preacher. Dr. Clark and them got a hold of them and said, don't Africa got enough preachers? He joined the Harlem Book Club. Actually, it's a block away from where I live. And he went back to Ghana and started a, a revolution. But one thing Kwame Nkuma said, he said, we can't celebrate the victory and the independence of Ghana if the rest of Africa is enslaved. Y'all don't understand that. So he wasn't just taking the glory for himself. He said, this means nothing if the rest of Africa is not free. And that means we got to, what, break the shackles of neocolonialism. Because right now, that's where Africa is, in a state of neo-colonialism. I'm building a school in a temple in Ghana. And you know, Ghana this year wants to introduce French 
That's a mandatory language. Their, their national language is Ashanti tree. No schools are being taught in their native language. All education is taught in English, and now they want to introduce French. You're co so you still, the colonial master still got a loose around your neck. That means that the French prints the books. You got to have new French teachers. You got to, you see, right now France would collapse without the money they get from Western African countries that they enslave. Let me say it again so that you understand. France would be a third world country and would collapse without the money they get, the billions they get every year from West Africa. That's Senegal, Gambia, Cote d'Ivoire, all those countries there. They are financing France. So I just need you to get clear. We are a powerful people, people. You got to understand that, but we have to begin to take control of our own education. Think about this. Would the rabbit send his children off to Fox School to be educated on how to be good rabbits? No, they're probably going to end up as rabbits too. And if the rabbit gets a Nobel Peace Prize after all of that, then what did he actually get the prize for? You begin to answer, we got six Africans, seven, they got Nobel Peace Prize, and there's no peace. So we have to begin to understand. We got to take control of the educational system from pre-K to PhD. You see, I sat on the council of, called CB, the Council of Independent Black Institutions, and we were raising kids from pre-K to 12. But then at the 12th grade, we sent them off to Wolf School. And we lost almost all of them. Because the wolf recognize how bright these young men are. They give them, oh, listen, you can come and work to AT&T for 200000 You think he's coming back to the hood? No, I don't think so. So they know what to do. They know how to entice our young people, our young gifted minds. I'm forever reading the paper where some Nigerian get scored off the charts in terms of SATs and all of that. That means he knows the European culture better than the Europeans. But then they brag about they're going to an Ivy League school. They was accepted at all the Ivy League schools. They should be smacked. <laughs> because you're not going to benefit Africa now. You're going to these Ivy League schools. And obviously, this information isn't going back to Nigeria to help develop a very corrupt country. All right? So we have to begin to think now. We got to stamp, approve our young people. And the European Jews are using our model. This is not their model. They're using our model. If there's more than six families, they have to open up a synagogue. If they have a synagogue, they have to open up a school. Not only that, the people who go to this have to be able to walk there. So that means it's in your community. If it's in your community, you have to control the stores in your community. And you only shop there. Do y'all see what's happening? Now, do we call that racism? No, they call it smart business. When you try to do it, it's racism. You faulty thinking, people. We're upside down, inside out, and backwards. We have to begin to... We don't have neighborhoods. I mean, communities. We got neighborhoods. You don't even know the next door neighbor. In some cases, you don't want to know. Okay? So we have to begin the word community, black unity. Kim unity, the word Kim, black, black unity. And we are moving far away from that. So the more information we have, the better off we'll be and the better we'll be able to control. So people, I do have a couple of decks here. I'll, I think I only brought four with me. It's the beginning alphabet on teaching yourself the Badi Netra, our ancient classical language. Okay, we sell them at 35 today. They are 30. Uh, so like I said, I only have four decks with me. Uh, but... And I teach it from symptomatic thinking. Symptomatic means it is what it is. It's, if a black cat crosses right now, what are you thinking? Huh? You're thinking good luck. You're thinking, no, it means the black cat's going somewhere. We automatically assign all these other things. <laughs> That's from mythology and superstition. African people are the most mythological and superstitious people on the planet. 
as long as we continue to think like that, we will continue to be controlled. No, the black cat probably going home. He's going to get something to eat. He's going somewhere. Has nothing to do with no luck. Has nothing to do with no witchcraft, no nothing. You see how we've been programmed. That's symbolic thought versus symptomatic. Let me say this. All religions are based upon symbolic thought. I don't even have to prove they exist. Just believe. I can't find nobody's body in the Bible. Not their bones, not their grave site. But when I talk about ancient Kimber, we can go tomorrow. I can show you their bones, their grave site, their temples, their work, their writing. That's symptomatic thought. That means it is what it is. If I don't mythologize about it. Let me make another statement. There's some, let me clear up the thing about ritual. Even most rituals, even the word ritual, is a mythology. Symptomy. For example, I saw the sister saving the room. Now, some people say that's a ritual. I say, no, it's not. That's a symptomal attitude about cleansing the air, about keeping good vibrations. Scientific proof shows that when sage is in the air, all harmful bacteria is destroyed. In fact, in that room, a week later, they still will not appear. It's a scientific study showing you. So it's simply, that's not some, so we're doing some good things and we call them rituals. The brother poured libation here. They said, oh, that's a ritual. No, that's a sensible act of honoring our ancestors. Take that word out. We can't take the European's word and redefine it. I know we've done that. Oh, yeah, that's my nigga. You know, you're trying to make it sweet. No. <laughs> the word is what it is. Keep it in its proper context. Okay? So, um, with that done, I also bought only two copies, but I bought the book Soul and Legacy, because I'll be making reference to this. Uh, George D. and James did a magnificent job. His job was done so well, he was killed as a result of this because he let secrets out from his order that wasn't supposed to necessarily come out. But his attitude was like mine. This is about educating the people. It's about empowering the people. So that's the step he made. He, the price of knowledge sometimes is death. Okay, and he was willing to take that. So George M. James, he basically takes every so-called Greek philosopher and tell you where they studied. They studied all in Africa, except at the feet of the temple. And then went back and became the first teachers in Europe. So I'm going to, with that, I'm going to start. Before I go, though, there any questions on what I covered last week? The four golden ages. The four golden ages of ancient Kemet. And let me just talk about the European Egyptologists break Egypt into 31 dynasties. Done by Manasseh, who was supposed to be the high priest of ancient, of Amun Temple during the time of the Ptolemies. Because the Ptolemies were Greeks and Macedonians who were ruling Egypt, and they wanted to know the history of the people they were ruling. And so Manasseh had access to all the books, and he was supposed to break down Kemet's history into family groupings. So a dynasty is not like a decade, not 10 years, not like a century, 100 years, not like a millennium, a 1,000 years. A dynasty is a family rule. So it could be 28 years, 57 years, 150 years. A family rule or the same ideology. For example, like Harrenhal wasn't connected to the royal family, but he was keeping the same ideology of reinforcing Amun. Okay, so therefore that dynasty stays the same. The ancient Greeks without question the beginning of Western civilization, but the first civilization in the Grecian history was the Pelagians. The Pelagians were undoubtedly members of the Hermetic race, just simply saying the black race. Ancient Greece is without question the beginning of Western civilization, but the first civilization in Grecian history was the Pelagian. The Pelagian civilization sprang up its roots around 2500 BCE. The Pelagians are a satellite coming from ancient Egypt who were colonizing or moving in the whole Mediterranean area. The oldest race of mankind is the Hermetic or the Black race. The Hermetic people were civilized civilization builders. They spread out into uh, every culture in the world. 
to the east. When you look at the most remote civilization of Asia and Europe, you will find these Hamites, or these small black people. They were the founders of civilization in Europe, blacks branched out from North America and spread across the Mediterranean and in Southern Europe, and then left its mark on the entire European continent. The Pelagians were undoubtedly members of the Hermetic race. Five of the main Greek city-states were said to be founded by the descendants of these Semites. Corinthia was by the Phoenicians, Thebes, Cambus, and the, uh, also uh, Cambus from the Phoenicians. Uh, Laconia, these are the Sparta, um, these are the main places, Athens, all of these Argon, these were all the major cities in Greece, were all founded by these black Pythagians. The Pythagians were made of various tribes, including the Tarians, the Legions, the Cambodians, and the Gormelians. And all of these tribes actually come from ancient Kush. So I'm just trying to give you just a little background there. As previously noted, the Greek city-states were founded and developed by maritime colonizers from Phoenicia and Kenneth. Who are the Phoenicians? They got you thinking those are white people. Those were the ancient blacks who traveled the sea. They had the first great navy, okay, the Phoenicians, and they were great traders and commerce. In fact, when we think of ancient Egypt, you think of the pyramids, you think of all of these temples, but you don't think of the greatest economy the world has ever seen. Let me say it again. You're looking at the greatest economy that the world has ever seen. Where you can see 5,000 workers, their family, their houses, taking care of everything that they do. Build the greatest monuments and temples, and everyone is taken care of. There is no inflation in the land. There's a bartering system, and there's a system that makes sure everyone is taken care of. No such thing as homelessness. No such thing as a senior citizen home. No such thing as an orphan. Every child belongs to the state and is taken care of by family. Okay, so all of that's in ancient Kenya. We don't talk about that. Uh, uh, if I have time, I'll give you 10 great points about the pyramid. They've been lying to you about the pyramid. The pyramid is not a tool. Okay, I'm going to talk about all these other things that the pyramid does. So let me move on here. We are also told that they built canals, uh, subterranean waterworks, dams, walls of, astronomy, of, of astounding strength and most excellent construction. Five years of the um, theosophy, theosophy, edited by George Robert, that's the name of the book, Reed. Uh, London Reed. There's a couple of books, I'm trying to give you some references that you can go to. The deities of the Pelagians were predominantly the same as the ancient Kometa U, the ancient Kemet. Uh, and, and I give a book here that you can find all of that. So these, all of the Greek gods and goddesses, their origin comes from Kemet. Zeus is at the high of the list. Zeus comes from Ethiopia and has to go back every year to get charged. Did they tell you that? No, I got some pictures here to show you. All right, the Pelagians were eventually subjugated by the Hellenites and later assimilated into the Indo-European Hellenic population. But when we speak of Greece, as the origin of Western civilization, let us not forget that it was the Pelagians, the black people, who were the original inhabitants and who were the bearers of civilization in that era. So all that we think of when we think of Greece, the Parthenon and all of that, was set up by the ancient blacks that were there. Just like in Rome, it was the Acrusians, the Acrusians, are the same as the Pelagians who come from ancient Kemet. Uh, Acrusians, they said, now this is mythology, they said that when more whites filtered into the area, they knew that life was going to be over. All the blacks got in boats and left. That's an ancient room. That's not in Troy. I mean, that's pretty deep. I mean, it's not like they know something we don't know. Uh, the Greek city, oh, I already mentioned this, Greek city state. All right, now let me just show you some pictures. These are what the ancient Pelagians look like. So you get an idea of what's here. Look, this is Greece in 550. Greece just starts. It's all black, all black, all black. Let 
Minyans and the Pelagians were the original black inhabitants of Greece. And here you see uh, the, the warrior here, all in black. <coughs> Note Herodotus in his book, The Persian Wars, in 440 BCE, this is all still pre Alexander, remember he's 332, identifies the Spartans not as white, but as a combination of Phoenician and Nimyad who along with the Pelagians were original black inhabitants of Greece. See Herodotus text below. So I just, again, you can quote, even the Europeans are saying that European scholars, that these original people were all black. This is a silver, a silver coin done in 550 to 470. Black faces as the rulers and leaders of Greece. How many people got this in your history book when you were studying ancient Greece? Zero. That's about what I thought. Greek addicts attack, uh, added a uh, black figure, a vase of the Hopalites leaving home. This is 510 BCE. All warriors leaving their homes in Greece. And to the right is Zeus and the Eagle Oracle, 460. Zeus is black. And so the oracle, the highest oracle in ancient Greece is black from Ethiopia. So I'm trying to show you this. This is not like a feel good. I'm not trying to damn nobody. I'm just trying to let you know the origin of where this comes from. Again, the uh, Maxim in Sicily. You see they were black. In fact, even today, you, a lot of people from Sicily, uh, when they came to America, they were classified as black folks and were treated just like black people. In fact, Italians only in the 1900s became officially white people. But they made them honorary white people. Uh, the Irish and the Italians were called niggas and, and treated just like black people, and they weren't considered white. But as the white population was dwindling, they needed some more numbers, so they made them honorary white folks. But if you were to go to Sicily, you would see a lot of folks speaking Italian looking like y'all in this room. And here you see uh, pictures 430 to 420, which is still prior to Alexander. Uh, here in Macedonia, uh, to the right, you see the warriors here, 490 BCE. This is Hercules. Hercules, yep. I know y'all seen the white version of Hercules. Hercules was a black man. And here he is depicted here slaying um, some kind of creature, mythological creature. But Hercules, again, the whole legend was an African. And all the ancient pictures of Hercules is an African. With an Afro. When they show the movie, he got long, stringy, blonde hair and, and, and melanin deficient. The ancient name of the country is Holos, or Hala, or Elada. That's the Greek. Uh, when we say Greek, that's the Roman rendering of it. And so we're actually talking, we're using the English name based upon what the Romans said. And so when we say Greek or Greek Latin, it's called Gracia, as used by the Romans, and literally means the land of the Greeks. So here, just talking about Rhodes, Crete, Cyprus, all the shores here were all originally inhabited by African people. Uh, where did Darians come from? Darian people of ancient Greece, they, their name is mythologically derived from Dora, the son of Helen. Y'all know the story of Helen and Troy. They stole Helen, she came back. The husband went to war, okay. So the people who are the descendants of that, or, or call them. These new divisions soon began fighting. Although the Greek culture had spread throughout much of the world, it was politically divided. The period of ancient Greece after Alexander the Greek is called Hellenic. Now Hellenic, let me just give you a little background. I just explained that the original people were black. Rome, it was, uh, Italy, and Greece, and Iona. All that area around there was colonized by the ancient Greeks, I mean, ancient Kemetra Inc. They set up temples there. They left temples where they would educate, watch this, 
and they would try to bring these savages who came from the north out of a barbaric state. <coughs> In fact, Thale, T-H-A-L-E-S, the first Greek philosopher, is not Greek, he's from Iona. He went to a comedic temple in Iona, got a scholarship to go to Kemet. Sound familiar? We get these scholarships. Scholarships to go back to Kemet, studied in Kemet for 22 years, and came back and set up the first school of philosophy and thought and mathematics in all of Europe by a non black. So I'm just trying to give you just a little background here so that you, you'll uh, be able to appreciate who we are. So when we say Hellenic, this is the Asian, this is the Eurasian. And I say Eurasian because Europe is not a continent. Europe is just Western Asia. There's only six continents in the world, and Europe is not one. It's just the Western part of Asia. So we'll put it together and say Eurasian. Yes, sir. Yeah, that happens around 1200 BCE. This is the, again, uh, the people, indigenous people who, uh, who were there mixed with other people, and then you got the northerners coming there. And so there's a battle for possession in that. Uh, Homer writes about this. Now, Homer, I know the Greeks try to claim Homer. Homer said he was Egyptian. And if you look at the old, Homer describes himself as having swarthy skin and kinky hair. And then they show you a, a Wazungu, a European, on the cover. So that means that they, they're thinking, you don't know what you're reading. Look at this image. You know an advertising uh, image, uh, image is ten times more important than the spoken word. So even though he tells you who he is, they just adopt him and we don't even question him. Okay, by 146 BCE, the Romans had conquered the Greeks and the city state. So now let me explain. So I'm going to go back, I'm going to have to backtrack to talk about the Ptolemy because the Macedonians conquered Greece, and they are ruling Greece. But now, <coughs> many of these leaders are in Egypt. Now, and I call it Egypt now because it's Egypt now, it's not Kemet. Ptolemy is a title. It's a Macedonian Greek Greek king. Cleopatra is a title. It's the so-called queen of the Macedonian Greek king. So, they had names. You had Ptolemy Philadelphia, the city of Philadelphia is named after him. Uh, you had Cleopatra Bernice, up to Cleopatra the seventh. There were seven Cleopatras and 14 Ptolemies. I think I mentioned last week that the Cleopatras was wearing the Ptolemies out. Okay. Okay, so now, <laughs> everybody kind of, I kind of got you where we are now. So now, the power is in Egypt under the Ptolemy. But now, while the Ptolemy is eating grapes and enjoying, the, you know, the beauty of ancient Kemet, the Romans are gaining power. When they defeat them, they had just come from the Pyrenees War. You know, that's against Hannibal and the Carthaginians. And Hannibal, in 200 and something, go into, into he goes across into Spain across the Alps, France, and then comes back into Italy. He confronts the Roman army seven times. He's outnumbered 20 to 1. And he defeats them all seven times. He whoops them so bad, you can read about it. <laughs> if you go to places like West Point and all of that, they talk about the strategy of Hannibal. The Romans were rigid and they you know, in the row, and they line up. And, but what they don't talk about is the genius. Now, Hannibal left Carthage with all black warriors and elephants. He got into Spain, and he didn't get the weather report. As, <laughs> as he went across the Alps in the winter, almost all his elephants died. Only one or two actually made it the other side. But he lost many troops in the, in the bitter winter. But he was such a great organizer and such a powerful leader that he enacts troops on his way. Because guess what? Rome had created so many enemies, terrorizing everybody, making everybody pay taxes, that 
almost everybody was willing to fight against Rome to bring them down. So Hannibal was able to feed on this. And he was annexing all these, like the ghouls. The ghouls are what we call the French today. Hannibal talks about they were naked savages throwing rocks at them from the mountains. Meaning to say he whooped that tail and annexed them. And they fought with them against the, uh, the, the, the Greek, the Romans. He came into Rome backwards. They, they, they thought he would come, you know, the waterway. But he came in towards the land. Now they claimed that Hannibal was not victorious. But see, they didn't understand Hannibal's plan. No, he did not sack Rome. He could have, but he did not. He wanted Rome to sign some type of treaty that they would leave Carthaginians alone and they would have peace. So he whooped their tail, like I say, seven times. He was actually within 100 miles of the Roman city and did not come in and destroy Rome when Rome was actually almost defenseless. Rome sent 100,000 soldiers against 20,000. And the 20,000 decimated the 100,000 in three hours in an area about the size of Central Park. And that's some fighting, y'all. That's some serious fight. And Hannibal wasn't no place pushing buttons telling people to go. He was leading the charge, slicing folks up like Swiss cheese. Okay, all right, so you got to understand this is a tenacious warrior. Uh, he eventually tried to come to some type of agreement with Rome, and the Romans were so scared of Hannibal that even a hundred years after Hannibal dead, died, they would use Hannibal's name to put fear in Roman's heart. If kids act up, they said, you don't act, if you don't get right, Hannibal come get you. Oh. You know, like that was, that was, that was like, you know, you must straighten up because I don't want Hannibal coming. Okay, all right. So that was, they would use that name. Hannibal goes back and he's betrayed when he goes back to Carthage, his own brother, and other people sell out and they sell him out. Eventually he just dies. Uh, but they're defeated and there's a treaty with the Second Clarion's War and Rome takes control of all of North Africa. So I'm trying to get you up to date here. So Rome takes, so Carthage was the last stronghold there. Remember, Kemet was already controlled by the Macedonians and Greeks. <coughs> so now, here's a timeline of Greece. So let's put it in the proper spatial perspective. In 776, that's the traditional date of the first Olympic game. And almost everybody in that first Olympic game were black. In fact, there's no such thing as Greco-Roman wrestling. That's Nubian Kushite wrestling. And all you have to do is just check the records and you'll see. Okay. And they're still doing it today. Okay. So that's 776. That kind of starts long. All these cities that the Palladians had started up now competed each other in an Olympic game. In 750, Greek cities planted colonies on the Mediterranean coast adopted the Phoenician alphabet. So in 750, before 750, the Greeks didn't even write. Now you have to understand, we've already had four golden ages, 3,500 years in ancient Kemet of writing, sculpturing, plotting the stars and the heavens, and in 750 BCE, they just getting an alphabet from us. So just trying to put things in their proper perspective. In fact, when Thales was studying in 640, they said, your people are like children. Each generation you have to start over. You don't even have a record of your ancient history. Okay, so that's Africans talking to these Europeans. Okay, in 595, we have Solon give um, Athens a new construction. This is the start of the rise of democracy in Greece. Uh, Solon is the one that says, he is the one that tells you about Athens. That's how we, I mean, uh, Atlantis. The word Atlantis we get from Solon. Solon studied with the ancient Kemetian and they told them about great civilizations before the flood. And so we, everything that you think you know about Athens comes from what Solon said. That would be like following rabbits to study with the fox on what rabbits said. Okay. I don't know if you follow me there. The Persian Wars. Athens and Sparta, led by Greeks in defending their own land and invasion. So in 490, 
the Persians were controlling Egypt. And 447 works again on the Parthenon. 447, Greece was still predominantly African people, so the architects and engineers from Chemex came to build the Parthenon, as well as building many of the cathedrals in ancient Europe. Um, okay. Athens philosopher Socrates uh, is condemned to death. In fact, all, let me say it, all of the so-called Greek philosophers were kicked out of Greece. All of them. For teaching foreign thought. What's the foreign thought? African philosophy, African spirituality. Today, they're glorifying these people because after they came out of the Dark Ages, they realized how powerful these people were. But the Greek people, the Europeans, the Hellenists, who occupied Greece, who displaced the Pelagians, the blacks, didn't want to hear nothing about black stuff. So when these new philosophers who had studied in ancient Kemet came back talking about triangles and pyramids and the sun and the moon, they were like, get out of here. Stone them. Kick them out. In fact, I just want to put this footnote. Europeans know about Greek philosophers from the Moors. When the Moors came into Moors, the, the Arabs under Islam sacked Egypt in 640, CE, the Commonwealth. That's the beginning of the Moors. So they moved across North Africa which was the territory of the Romans. And like I said, Roman tyranny was so vicious that they just welcomed the Muslims in. So all of North Africa became Muslim. And then they moved into Spain in 711 CE in the Common Era. In 711, Europe is in the Dark Ages. Why was Europe in the Dark Ages? Because Rome had fell. Rome was their connection to the Western world to the Asian world, to Africa. When Rome fell by the Vandals and, and the northern Germanic tribes, and just tore it up, Europe fell into the Dark Ages because they were disconnected from the source of information, of knowledge in the world. The Moors came in, built universities, taught algebra. The Moors didn't create algebra. They're using the Arabic word. So they got this from Africa. They called it algebra that comes from them. Uh, algorithms. All of this comes from the Moors. Uh, they set up the first public bath because they were really funky and they had to do something about that. So the first bath, public bath was set up. Uh, all of that. In fact, seven major universities the Moors set up. Later they were converted and they kicked the Moors out in 1492. So they were there over 700 years. Some of those castles and temples are still there today. Many of them have been converted to um, Catholic uh, buildings, worship churches, uh, a few uh, museums, but almost all those buildings that they built <coughs> almost a thousand years ago are still standing. 1492, the war is over, and we talk about the Crusades. Europe is trying to rebuild. You have to understand, Europe is financially poor. People poor, food poor in the 1400s. They just had a devastating war that, and plagues that damaged almost their whole population. And now, this is when they go to the sea, which is the explorer. And what they're not telling you, they're going looking for food. They're looking for food, y'all. They ain't going to trade nobody. It's like the Vikings. They're trying to make the Vikings now great explorers and traders. When you're exploring and trading, that means I got some stuff on my boat and I'm going to trade when I get there. The only thing they had in their boat was machetes and axes and arrows. And they wasn't in the weapon business. They was going to destroy. And so even other Europeans were afraid of the Vikings. Okay, so I'm just trying to put things in a proper perspective. So 1492, the Queen gave a session and said all Moors have to be out and all Jews have to be out. So the Moors and Jews, but this is what they said. On April 1st, 
I want you to go down to the river, go to the ocean, and we'll have boats waiting for you with food and water so that you can make your journey. So the Jews stole all the stuff they had, the boys got all that stuff together. They got down to the boat and the army was waiting on them. April Fool. And decimated them. So today, y'all got an idea of selling April Fool's Day, not understanding that it was created on the decimation of African people. So the real fool is on you. All right, so let's, let me get you back here where I'm at. Hold on. You're like about three quarters in there. I'm just about finished with Greek. I'm going into the, with the Ptolemy, and then we'll end up with Rome. Even though I just kind of gave you a precept to Rome. Right. Castles, the first castles were built, not even in Egypt. The first castles were built in Kosh, in the Sudan. There's pictures on my uh, 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 presentation I do on Kemet Tech cost relationship. <coughs> the fighting that you see, the weapons you see, the Romans using those big things and climbing up castle walls, they got that from the Nubians. The Nubians and the Kemet U were building trade castles <coughs> 3000 BCE. Did you hear me? 3000 BCE. Even the castles in Ireland were built by African people. The original inhabitants of Ireland are black people. Who do you think the little green people were? The leprechauns. They were black folks. And white folks were trying to kill them and take their gold. Ain't no gold in Ireland. So listen to their folklore. They're telling you who they are. We are killing you. Listen. For African people, in order for you to be our enemy, you got to do something to us. You got to do something to us or our family. Now you cross the line, you are enemy. For your beings, you got to have something they want to be their enemy. You got land, they came to Jamaica, saw the white beaches, oh, we're taking this. They came to Australia, Tasmania, saw these beaches, and oh, we're taking this. Y'all are enemies. Came across America, Native Americans, all this land, we're taking this. You are enemies. Anybody that has something of value is the enemy of Eurasia. So I know that's different for African people because y'all think it's all, you know, what did we do to them? You know, to get this type of whooper. No, you got stuff they want. So I'm trying to break this down to the lowest common denominator. Okay, so now I had talked about that the original inhabitants people were of uh, African descent. But what I wanted to tell you, the area where Greece is today is a very mountainous area with a lot of waterways and swamp areas. It wasn't conducive of farming. So that's why the Greek civilization had to go to the water to trade with other people. They couldn't produce enough food to feed their population. And so they became a trade state. And with the help of the Phoenicians and the ancient Kemet U, they got into the shipping buildings early from the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians learned them, taught them that. And, that, and no one talks about how powerful the Kemetic Navy was. There's a, look it up, there's the legend of the Sea People. And the Sea People, these Asians who had the boats like the Vikings coming around terrorizing everybody. The Hittites, who had a famous battle with the ancient Kemetic U. Um, the sea people came and destroyed all of that, all around the Mediterranean. They came towards Kemet, Kemet got in their boats, came out and met them, and decimated the sea people, and they were obliterated from history. Okay, so I'm just trying to show you the power behind the navy of ancient Kemet. Their major crop in Kemet, I mean in Greece, was olive. Olive. And olive, the olive crop was started by the ancient Kemet U, who had been using that as a colony. Olives are unedible when they come, we take them from the tree. You gotta take the olives, they're a little hard like marble, you gotta soak them in oil for a year before you can pick them and use them. So in other words, so when you pick this year's crop, it, it, it's not good to next year. So you're harvesting last year's crop, 
And picking this year's crop, you have to keep it going like that. And then they're exporting it all around the world. And that became one, and they use that to get food, rations, and other things uh, from the more agriculture. But I wanted to say this. The dams that were built there were all built by the Africans throughout Rome and Greece. They inherited a structure, just like here in New York City. Some of the major buildings and dams and stuff that were here in New York City were built here by the Moors. So the Europeans came and inherited that. And you think that they built everything. No, they didn't. A lot of those dams are built. I was in uh, Detroit looking across into Canada on the island. And there was um, a giant structure there on the island and everything. And so the European guy asked the guy, he says, um, it was a Native American guy, he says, did your people build this? He said, no. These mounds and these great structures were done by blacks before we got here. This is the Native American, the red man, talking about what was going on here in America before they got here. So they just inherited it. So people think that the red man is responsible for the mound. They're not the mound builders. The mound builders are the indigenous Africans who came here first. Very many Greek city states were located by the sea. Almost many of them confined as they were by steep hills and mountains or by the sea itself if they were, if they were on islands. Suffering from a shortage of agricultural land from an early stage in their history, therefore many Greeks looked to the sea for their livelihood for a period of about 150 years after 750 BCE. Many city states sent, sent out groups of their citizens to found colonies in distant shores of the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea. These established strong trading ties with their mother city. Greek traders soon dominated maritime trade for the Mediterranean, edging out the Phoenicians who had preceded them and adopted a mental coinage. Uh, much uh, to see. So they mentioned the coins that we see today were kind of mapped out. This is an Athens coin. All right, people, I'm about three quarters. I only have about a half an hour left. We're going to take a break, and then I'll finish up here with the Ptolemies and the Romans. So at this point, we'll take a break. Is there any questions on what I did first? first thing? Come on, I wasn't that good. We only have one or two questions here. Okay. All right, so I'll, con I'll continue with where we are. Let's move into art and architecture. Greek architecture is known for its grace and simplicity. The finest buildings the Greeks erected were their temples, and the most famous of these is the Parthenon in Athens. I already explained that Athens was created was founded by African people. The center of each temple was space known as the cella. Here you are located the statues of the gods. In front of the cella was the porch. And both porch and cello were surrounded by a colonnade of columns. <coughs> Each column was topped by a capital and carved blocks of stone, and the top of rested <coughs> um, and then rested the roof, and these elements went together to form a simple yet gracious building. And I'll give you an example of that. Religion among the Greeks. The Greeks worship a pantheon of gods and goddesses headed by the chief of the god Zeus. Other gods included Hera, Zeus' wife, Athena, <coughs> goddess of wisdom and learning, Apollo, the god of music and culture, Aphrodite, goddess of love, Dionysus, the god of wine, Hades, the god of underworld, and Diana, goddess of the hunt. Greek religion placed little emphasis on ethical conduct. I think I mentioned this before. I'll say that again. Greek religion placed little emphasis on ethical conduct. Stories about the gods portrayed them as lying, cheating, being unfaithful, getting drunk, and so on. As many traditional religions as Greek gods and goddesses have seen more of a potential source of help rather than a source of devotion. So we kind of ask these guys to help you on your journey. 
but it had nothing to do with trying to be a good person, a moral person, and having values. That's something that African people introduced to that whole concept. 